Wait. It in port on the left? Right? Okay, port on the left. All right. Well, we'll do the best that we can. <laughs> I realize a number of you weren't able to make it in for Sunday school, and I've been asked to kind of reiterate a few things. Um, this chart that you see up here is uh, uh, what's called a dispensational chart, and you don't need to let it intimidate you, nor do you need to let uh, the teaching of the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven uh, intimidate you. You don't need to worry about that. And uh, the reason is, is that it can be easily understood with a little bit of study. It just takes some time. Uh, repetition is oftentimes the best form of teaching. You just keep getting it time and time and time again until it finally sinks in. Uh, I learned in studying some things, this is just for me, that oftentimes the more of my senses I can employ when I'm studying something, the better the, that it sticks with me. For instance, if I have to memorize something, it's better for me to put my finger on the page I get the sense of touch and run my finger under the words and read the words with my eyes and speak the words with my mouth and hear the words that I'm speaking and it tends to stick with me better that way. I would walk around the house when I was reading things like that and just because I get tired of sitting and I walk around and read or get sleepy and walk around and read out loud and that teens, tends to use as many of my physical senses, my five regular senses, not counting the sixth sense, to learn things. So when it comes to this, it's a matter of repetition. It's just learning certain things. Now what we're talking about now is the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. Every one of these things that you see up here represented, starting all the way back when it came to the devil, he messed the whole thing up, Adam messed it up, and Noah messed it up, Abraham messed it up, Moses messed it up, Jesus Christ came, we hung him on the cross, that ended uh, not good for everybody else there. And then you're given in this time period, this is called the church age. This begins with the giving of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'll explain this to you here in just a, a little bit so you understand it better. But the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter number 2. It's not that He wasn't manifested back here, but His manifestation is different after Jesus Christ has ascended up to heaven. In Acts chapter number 1, this same Jesus that you saw shall also come in like manner. Now that He's gone, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter has come, and must needs that I go so the Comforter can come. The Holy Spirit is here. Now you're in a different kingdom altogether. Everything here, after Adam lost both of the kingdoms back here, he lost both the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. God took the kingdom of God back with him to heaven. He left the kingdom of, uh, of heaven down here into the hands of men. Now right here, after he gets done with uh, Moses right here, before Moses comes in, he turns this thing over to judges for a while and then kings. And the kings mess up and they mess up and I'll give you a list of those in just a little while. They're on that other board there. And it ends in uh, Jeremiah 22 with a man by the name of Jeconiah. He's such a wicked king that the Lord cuts his, the, the J, meaning Jehovah or after Jesus there. He cuts that off and it's just Keniah and said that his seed shall not prosper or anyone on the throne of David. That's a picture of the virgin birth that you need to understand. That's setting things up so that when Jesus is born, Luke chapter number 2, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger, suddenly there was with the angel the host of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace toward, good, uh, toward uh, men, peace, goodwill toward men, so on and so forth there. That's Luke 2. That's the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because His lineage is not male, it's not human, it is God. So he's born of a virgin. That's important. Your new Bibles attack the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. The virgin birth of Jesus Christ is one of the main doctrines in the Bible. If you don't have a virgin-born Savior, ladies and gentlemen, then you're still dead in trespasses and sin. If your Savior was not pure and perfect, then He can't die for you. You have to have a sinless Savior that can only come by the blood of Jesus Christ being God's blood. That's Acts chapter 20, verse number 28. Uh, Take heed to, the over, uh, to oversee the flock, uh, over the flock which I've made you overseers, which he hath purchased with his own blood. That's God's blood. Now that means when you get saved, you're saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I won't mention any names or anything like that, but John MacArthur says that it didn't make any difference. <laughs> <laughs> what he said was is that if he just died, it would have been fine. No, sir. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. You need the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You need to claim that blood of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. 
And when we have the Lord's Supper, you have the bread down here that's unleavened bread, and you have grape juice. And when you drink the grape juice, it's a tight picture of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses, that cleanses, that cleanses from all sin. Amen. All means all there, without distinction. Now, when you get to this thing here, what I'll show you in just a few moments here, all this here is, is the kingdom of heaven has been left down here in man's hands. The kingdom of heaven is a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. It's all been left, then Jesus Christ shows up right here. When Jesus Christ shows up, He has the offerings of both. It's just this side of Calvary. He comes up 30 years here, and then at the 30 years of age, He's baptized, sent out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. After 40 days, he's tempted out there, and then he overcomes the temptation. He starts his ministry. His ministry runs three and a half years. He has the opportunity to set up a Jewish kingdom. If they had accepted him as the Messiah, this will be Matthew chapter 10, go not unto the way of the Gentile, nor unto the Samaritan, but only to the lost sheep of the house of what? Israel. You're not Israel. You weren't even thought about at that point. Right over here, they have an opportunity if they accept him as the Messiah, and he's got a backup plan, and 225 days later with Stephen, if they accept him, you would have predominantly a Jewish church. That's why after Calvary, Stephen, I mean, uh, uh, after the cross, after Calvary, Peter is still preaching, repent, and be baptized. You say, why? Paul hasn't been called onto the scene yet. They don't know anything about the mystery of the gospel and about the Jew and Gentile in one body. They don't know anything about the church. All they know is, I'm going to keep preaching what I was preaching over here. He said, why? We're still looking for a physical kingdom. Acts chapter number 1, verse number 6, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel, literal, physical, earthly kingdom? This one's not known about yet. Now, what happens here is, is the kingdom of God, or kingdom of heaven stays down here. Remember, the devil offers it to him when he comes up here at the beginning of the ministry, and the Lord leaves that down here, but there's no access to it now. In a sense, you can say that it's in somebody else's hands or it's in God's hands right now. The only kingdom that is available to anyone right now is during this time period, and it's called the kingdom of God. And Romans 14 and Luke chapter 17 teach you clearly there's only one way to get in. Do you know how it is? Do you know how it is? A man must be born again. John chapter number 3, how can I be born again? I have to crawl into my mama's womb again and come out? No, you must be born of water and of the Spirit, two births. Or you cannot see the kingdom of God, not heaven. John chapter 3, now let me just remind you of this, and I know I'm giving you a ton of information, I'm going to move to the other board here in a second. When Jesus Christ first came, this is the kingdom that they're looking for. They're looking for this millennial reign of Christ when Jesus comes and He's in charge of everything and Israel is in charge of the then known world. That's what they're looking for. They don't see this and they don't see this. When He shows up, they're looking for a Messiah that is going to bring in a military rule and set up a kingdom on earth. That's what they'd been taught. That's what the book of Isaiah says. The whole thing was literal, physical, earthly kingdom with an earthly king. And that's, <clears throat> excuse me, and that's what they're waiting on. So if you can imagine in your mind's eye that this right here doesn't exist. Now, if you follow the Bible, the tribulation would have taken place right after Calvary had they accepted him as, the, as Jesus Christ, as the Messiah. Stephen's over there preaching in Acts chapter number 7. The Lord stands up. People say he stands up to receive his soul. That's nonsense. Otherwise, he'd be up and down like a jack-in-a-box. Every time somebody died, he'd be standing up to receive their soul. He's standing up there because if that nation of Israel, all of those individuals, trust and take Jesus Christ at, through the Holy Spirit, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. If they had done that, you would have had Jesus Christ coming down, marking 144,000 male virgin Jews, and lo and behold, you know what would have happened? You'd have had this right here. And you might have only had that much of it left. The first half may have taken place, and the other half may have already uh, have to take place, and all you would have had is Judas would have come up from the pit, and there would have been your Antichrist. Jesus Christ would have had Matthew 27, 52, the bodies of many of the saints would slept, arose, and went into the holy city. That's not Gentiles. That's 144,000, Ezekiel chapter number 9, male virgin Jews that are going to get the, the mark of God in their forehead, and then they're going to go out and witness with signs, wonders, and miracles following. 
I know it's a lot of information, but you need to realize that right now, this is what I want you to get. This right here, the kingdom of God is operative here. If you put the kingdom of God in any other time period on that side of Calvary or after the church age, here in the tribulation or here in the, in the millennial kingdom, you're going to mess the whole thing up. Over here, you've got to have faith and works. You say, why? The Bible says these are they. This will be Romans 12, be Romans 14, and be Rome, uh, Rev, um, Ro Revelation 12, Revelation 14, and Revelation 20. These are they that had the faith in Jesus Christ and kept the commandments. Why? It's back to works. Remember this morning? It's back to works. Why? You're bringing in the kingdom. You enter into the kingdom, literal and physical kingdom, by your works of righteousness. In the millennial kingdom, you don't preach by, say, by grace through faith. You preach that Jesus Christ is Him sitting on the throne and you believe in Him. That's it. And in the millennial kingdom, you have to do all the works of the law. Now, you want to grab a hold of this because if you don't, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 in your Bible will make no sense to you whatsoever. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the constitution for this out here, and it all has to do with works. And that's where it fits perfectly. You don't have to worry about it. You ever think to yourself, now you probably didn't, you folks here probably have never done this. Uh, your eyes maybe wander where they shouldn't wander every now and then. In this time period right here, you know what he says? He said, if that's the case and it's causing you to lust, you better pull your eye out of your head, literally, because it'd be better to go in without an eye than it would be to go to hell with an eye. Or your hand touch something it shouldn't touch. He said, better for you to hack it off. You say, why? Better to go into heaven, into the millennial kingdom. Better to go out here and go through there and wind up in the right place at the great white throne without a hand than it is to wind up in hell with both hands or both feet. That's a literal application of Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He says, uh, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see, they shall see, they shall see the kingdom of heaven. You say, what will happen? Both kingdoms are here during this time period. In, the back, in Mark and Luke, he'll say kingdom of God. Why? Because both kingdoms are here during this time period. Both kingdoms are not here here. The only thing here is the kingdom of heaven. The only thing here is the kingdom of God. You want to see in a, uh, uh, a real mess? Try to take stuff that fits here and put it here, which many preachers do, and you're headed for trouble. You say, why? You have people doubting their salvation all the time. So this is a chart to try to help you to understand. Now, at the rapture of the church, which is on the back side of this board over here, at the rapture of the church, the body of Christ is closed. You need to understand that. However many are going to get in, I don't know how many are going to get in. They won't all be Baptists. They'll be every denomination you can imagine. And before denominations were around, people were getting saved. You go around over here till right after Calvary's cross, there's Jews in the body of Christ. They don't even know they're in the body of Christ. They don't even know there's such a thing as a body of Christ. They don't even know what they're looking for. They don't even know there's a church in existence. Acts chapter 2, the giving of the Holy Spirit, they're still preaching and they're still talking about tongues. Acts chapter 2, how heard we every man in our own language. By the way, Acts 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Stephen comes up, preaches, they resist the Holy Ghost. He's preaching to Israelites, to Jews. And Acts chapter 8, Ethiopian eunuch, and 9, Paul called out to the Gentiles, and there you go. Now, if you get the kingdom in the wrong place... And you try to say those people are looking forward to the cross and these people are looking back to the cross. You know what you're doing? You're not just saying something that makes your Bible study easy. You know what you're doing? You're as guilty of preaching a false gospel as somebody that believes Mary is your way to heaven. Yeah. You know what? You're teaching something that you're saying baptism will get you to heaven. Yeah. You know what you're saying? You're saying works will get you to heaven. Well, no, that's not really what... Yes, you are. Those people can't get saved looking forward to the cross. They have to get saved by doing what they're supposed to do. Right here, they better keep the law. If they don't keep the law, they ain't getting there. Right here, you can keep the law till the cows come home and you're still lost. Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah's Witness, Mormons come to mind right off, the top of my, right off the top of my head. The Bible says, you know what? He nailed the handwriting of ordinances to the cross. You're not under that. But I can show you the passages over here in Matthew. You know what it'll say? You better do, you better do, you better do, you better do. And if you don't, you ain't getting in. Why? Because he hadn't died yet. All right, now look at this chart over here. I'll give you the passages here in just a second. This is fair and balanced. We're on one side of the, one side of the platform and now the other side of the platform. 
<clears throat> Does it make any sense to you at all? I appreciate your interest in it. Um, it's, it's exciting for me to see you interested in studying the Bible. Much study is weariness to the flesh. Did you know that? And most people don't want to study the Bible and most people don't want to study anything for that matter because they're lazy. Now, I mentioned to you this this morning for the rehab. Uh, the, the recap of everything. The kingdom of heaven deals specifically with the Son of Man, has to do with earthly, literal, physical kingdom. It is predominantly Jewish, and it is achieved by works that are involved. There are signs that are involved. If you do these things, you can be these things. I gave you the passage in Matthew chapter number 3. That passage has to do with John the Baptist, who's preaching uh, the Lamb of God taking away the sin of the world. Same thing he mentioned in Isaiah chapter 40, and I showed you where that was a physical kingdom they're looking for. They're looking for that thing called the Millennial Kingdom. Hitler called that the Fourth Reich, the 4,000th year, he said of the people. Well, you got the wrong person trying to run it. Man can't bring the kingdom in. Everybody, Germany, Catholics, the Crusades, everybody, the Muslims, are trying to bring in a physical earthly kingdom. You're not going to bring in a physical earthly kingdom until Jesus Christ comes and eradicates all those that are opposing Him. That's the battle of Armageddon that takes place at the second coming of Christ, which we talked about this morning. This kingdom right here is the kingdom that you get, and the way you get people into this kingdom is by the new birth. That's John chapter number 3. How do I get in there? You have to be born again of the Spirit, not of water. Water is your physical birth. When a woman has a child, water breaks, and a physical that's the physical birth. Spiritual birth is through Jesus Christ. And you get sealed to the day of redemption in that. When I mentioned to you earlier about the book of John, always remember this, make a note, never forget it. John is written 25 years after the Pauline Revelation. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are somewhat uh, together there. there. There's a word there, I can't, I, it won't uh, come to me right now. Uh, but they're, they're synoptic, but there's another word there. But at any rate, those three right there are pretty close together, although they give different views of different things. They're entirely different from the book of John. Why? When John writes, John writes 25 years after Pauline Revelation... Now you have a lot of individuals that are trying to teach you now because Jesus Christ starts teaching about prophecy in Matthew chapter 24 and then He mentions it in Luke and Mark that you should be listening to that. That's still written to the Jew before Calvary's cross. He's talking about bringing in a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. It doesn't mention in John. You say, why isn't it mentioned in John? Well, that's because, you know, John wrote about it in Revelation. They don't know anything about John writing anything in Revelation. John doesn't write about that in, Revela in the book of John because this deals predominantly with the kingdom of God because he now knows things have changed. John knows. That's why you see John 3.16 and that's why you see the things of Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and that writing is in there to help you to rightly divide your Bible and to understand that John, when he wrote his accounts of what occurred, you see through there splashes of Pauline doctrine because he had all the whole thing right there in front of him. He doesn't deal a whole lot with prophecy about the king coming kingdom of heaven because he's dealing with individuals getting saved and getting in this kingdom right here. It doesn't have squat to do with him writing the book of Revelation. He wrote the book of Revelation because God wanted him to write the book of Revelation, not because it was a continuation of the book of John. That is uh, something people have a hard time understanding because you've been taught from all the schools that all the teaching is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are always together. No, if something is written 25 years later and there's a greater revelation given, it's going to be different. No question about it. It's going to be different. And generally speaking, it's because there's going to have been a greater revelation. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written. Now, I don't know what you'll think about what I'm about to say, but it's almost as if the Lord held John back to wait and see what they were going to do so he could put in the church age, and then he writes something there with the Pauline epistles. Thirteen epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote were all sitting there in front of John, and John understood perfectly the way of salvation and the way of the kingdom of God. He knew exactly what was going on. That's why you can, if you're careful with it, you can go into Revelation chapter 4 and John's caught up in the Spirit. John's a type of the church. John's the one in the book of John leaning on the breast of Jesus. And John's the one that has revelation that other ones don't have because he's closer to the Lord. He's a type picture of the bride of Christ that's there. 
All right, so you have a new birth. That's how you get into the kingdom of God. If you're going to get into the kingdom of God, you have to get in through the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Understand this as we move through this study. Once the last person is saved or as soon as the rapture happens, whichever one comes first, the second the rapture happens, the body of Christ is closed. Nobody else will be in the body of Christ. If somebody dies, gets their head cut off in the tribulation, even if for the testimony of Jesus Christ, their soul will go under a little altar down here on earth. They don't go up in there to heaven. They can't come to heaven. They're not in the bride of Christ. Up in heaven is going on as the judgment seat of Christ. Not down here. Down here is going to be tribulation, the Bible says, such as no man has ever seen before. Nothing you've ever could have possibly imagined is going to be going on down here while you're going up there at the judgment seat of Christ. While that's happening down here on the face of this earth, you have faith and works that are connected together. You have to take the mark of the beast in order to eat. You have to deny the mark of the beast and you may starve to death, but you can wind up going to the heart of the earth. The heart of the earth is opened back up, Abraham's bosom. You're saved in the tribulation under a Jewish gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. You're looking for a returning Messiah at the second coming of Christ. You're looking for this return. This return takes place right here. At the end of the uh, tribulation period, there's a second coming of Christ. That's what you're looking for. That's part of what you're preaching. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. It's a tribulation gospel. Now, I believe the Messiah is coming, but I believe it's the Son of God, not the Son of Man. All through Matthew 24, Matthew 25, all through the synoptic gospels, you see the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man, the Son of Man. Why? It's somebody on the earth looking for a kingdom that is coming to this earth. Are you with me so far? All right. No, I'm giving you a whole lot of information. All right. It starts off here with Satan. He's given both kingdoms. He blows it. It goes to Adam. I told you today, he was told to be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. He dies spiritually. And then everybody after him, that'll be in 1 Corinthians 15, 40. Uh, four, five, six, right along in there where he talks about the first Adam is of the earth earthy and the second Adam is of heaven heavenly and the first Adam you die and the second Adam you don't die. The first Adam is Adam. The second Adam is Jesus Christ. And you have to get in the second Adam in order to be saved. Adam lost his image. He lost the image of God when he messed up there and he died spiritually. I used the illustration this morning of the little baby. And I said, the little baby is born sinless. Doesn't know anything about sin. It's not imputed to him for sin. When that baby comes to the recognition of sin, the moment they come to the recognition of sin, that baby dies spiritually, but they don't die physically. People say, well, Adam didn't die. Adam didn't die. There's more ways to die, ladies and gentlemen, than just dying physically. You can die a spiritual death, and you die a spiritual death. Paul said, uh, I was alive once without the law. I'm in Romans 7. But when sin revived, I died. Paul did not die physically. What did he do? He died spiritually. Adam died spiritually. So did his wife. Deader than four o'clock, dead in trespasses and sin. They had to have a covering. The Lord provided lambskins for them and gave them an atonement, but kicked them out of the garden. They're cursed and puts a cherubim there so they can't get to the tree of life because if they had, they would have had eternal life and been living in a sinful condition. So he does that. He calls out a man named Noah. Noah winds up getting drunk after the whole uh, flood's over with. Messes up with everything. You have the Tower of Babel that comes in after that. The Tower of Babel, everybody gets together and talking and talking and talking. The Bible says that they said, well, Lord, if there's nothing that they could do, if they put their minds to it, they're going to build a tower that it sends up into heaven. And the Lord came down and conformed, confounded their language. You say, why? Man keeps messing the thing up. Every time he turns around, he messes it up. I don't mean to be so demonstrative and dogmatic. And when it comes to uh, my opinion of man, I'm giving you the Bible's opinion of man. No matter how smart and wise and uh, that we may think we are, we still mess everything up. There's, there's something in us that just always tends to mess everything up we put our hands on. All right, so Noah comes along. The Lord said to repent of me that I made man and in my spirit shall not always strive with man. I'm in uh, Genesis 6. And he says, Noah, I want you to build a boat. And Noah said, well, a boat will be a picture of me looking forward to the cross. I'll look forward to the cross. And the Lord said, what are you talking about a cross? What do you, what do you even know about a cross? Well, I was reading Psalms 22 the other day. It ain't even been written, Noah. Psalms 22. You hadn't even, you, you hadn't even had Moses write the Pentateuch yet. 
You don't even have the first five books in the Bible. What do you know about a cross, Noah? Get you some gopher wood and some pitch. Lord, you need some nails and stuff. No, no nails in the ark. You just need to put this thing together with biscuit cuts and tongues and grooves and different things like that and hinge joints and all that other kind of a stuff like that. I'll tell you how to build it and here's your blueprint. Noah looks at that and said, what in the world is that? It looks like a giant houseboat. The Lord said, well, that's as good a name as any, but I'd prefer to call it an ark. And anybody that gets in that ark is going to be safe. While you're building that ark, Noah, I want you to preach for 120 years and I want you to preach righteousness and tell people to do right and they can get on the ark. And Noah preached 120 years and only his family was that got in. They messed up. He calls out a man at this, this particular place here. It's Abram, not Abraham. Abram comes out there, the Ur of the Chaldees. He's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. And he's hunting and searching and hunting and searching. And God begins to develop with this man right here a group of people, a nation, a nation of Israel under this man right here. You want to make sure you get that. The Lord's deciding that man's messing the thing up, so now what He's going to do is He's going to get a nation. What's the nation going to consist of? His chosen people, Jews. From that point forward, He deals with Jews. When He gets ready, Moses comes along, and Moses comes up with this period of time called the law. Might I remind you I'm still talking about this kingdom right here the kingdom of heaven. It's literal and physical and earthly. There's no plan of salvation here that has anything to do with not meat and drink and not being able to be seen. There's nothing spiritual at all. There's nothing about getting in the body of Christ, nothing about getting in Jesus, none of that other stuff. It's about doing what the law says and if you don't do what the law says, you wind up going to hell. You think I'm kidding you? Ask Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They came up against Moses and rebelled and said, you take too much on yourself and I don't know who in the cat hair you think you are who died and left you God. I, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And Moses said, okay, I'll see you at noon at the OK Corral. And we'll let God settle the argument. And they step out there, the tent flap of their doors. And about the time they do, the Bible said the earth opened up and swallowed Korah, Dathan, and Byram, but not just them, and all that appertained unto them. Everybody that listened to them. God swallowed them up and sent them down to hell. They're not no second chance. They don't get a second chance. They're gone. You say, why? They were not supposed to rebel against Moses. I told you this morning, and I'm trying to hurry, I told you this morning, in Judges then, you come along and the Lord says, all right, bring him some Judges. If you'll remember, there's a man here and one of those Judges. His name is Samson. <laughs> Samson, what a, what, a, what a thing. Samson, an unusual fella. Samson had eye trouble. He was all time running around places he shouldn't be running around. And he found him a good wife and had a good father-in-law and the Philistines killed her. And he's always down there in a place that he wasn't supposed to be trying to get him uh, a prostitute. Delilah was a prostitute. I don't care how the movies paint her up. I don't care if they make her like, you know, well, she's, you know, some scorned woman and this and that and the other. She was a Philistine prostitute and she was forbidden by anybody, but especially a judge, to have anything to do with her. That judge wasn't supposed to cut his hair, he wasn't supposed to eat any raisins, wasn't supposed to drink any wine, wasn't supposed to do all that. Live right, do right, you touch a dead carcass, you have to cleanse yourself, you have to shave the head of your consecration, all these things. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Works, 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 works. Offer a ram, a lamb, and a he-goat. He doesn't offer any of those things. Well, one of the days he comes out, you know the story, he comes out there and she's, you know, Samson, I can't believe you're not telling me everything. I thought I was your only one. I thought you loved me. And he said, I wouldn't be in the mess I'm in if you don't constantly keep telling my secrets to everybody. Every time I turn around, you've already told them and they show back up at the door. He should have learned something. He should have realized every time he talked to her, she went and told them, it didn't, you know, two plus two is four. I mean, all they have to do is figure it out. She must have had something on him. And then finally he comes in there and he comes out there and she knows she's got him this time. And they come out there and got him. He can't break it. He can't bust it. His hair, his head's done been shaved. And they take him out there and he has eye trouble and his eyes are burned out of their sockets. And they make sport of him and laugh at him. And then he grinds at the mill and grinds at the mill and grinds at the mill. You know, it's an odd thing. You go through the book of Judges and you'll see them do right under the judge. And then you'll see the judge die and they do wrong. And then a judge arises up and they do right, and then that judge dies and they do wrong. And then a judge comes in and they do, sounds like Christians today, doesn't it? <laughs> and they do right, 
and then they wind up going the way of the American Indian. They disappear. Well, you know what, Hampson, Samson, he kills more in his death than he does in his life. And they come to the end of that thing right now, and there's a prophet down here. The Lord seems to like these things with S's in it. There's a prophet by the name of, of uh, Samuel. He's a real pro. He doesn't do much with his family. I know you're from the South. What you would think is, is that if he'd paid more attention to his family, his boys wouldn't have gone prodigal. That's what Billy Sunday's uh, wife said. Well, his son might not have gone prodigal if he hadn't spent so much time. Really, you don't view things from a soul standpoint. Billy Sunday won, they say, they say, more than a million people to Jesus Christ. More than a million. You say, well, what about his boy? Well, maybe if he spent attention to his boy, then a million people wouldn't have got in. How do you know? But you see, you care more about your family than you do about God's family. You care more about what you want to do than what God wants you to do. You, you're selfish. You're self-centered. What about time with me? What about time? What about me? Me, 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 me. The Lord said, what about me? But nowadays, what they want you to do is try to be in some kind of a balancing act and things like that. That's why I tell these guys, if they're called to preach, you better make sure your wife's with you. You know why a preacher can't have but one wife? Because whoever he's ministering to becomes his second wife, and she requires a lot of time. I'm not being funny. I'm being dead serious. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort to try to minister to people and to do the things. And to, to be somebody has to be put on a back burner somewhere. And it's usually the preacher's wife, usually the pastor's wife, the evangelist's wife, the prophet's wife. Samuel comes along, he's obviously married, although you see nothing about his wife mentioned. But he's got kids and they can't be out of wedlock. So his kids come up, guess what happens? They turn out like Aaron's kids. You ever look at Aaron's kids? <laughs> the Lord has to burn them up but save the jackets they're in because they're so unholy. He literally burns them and then tells Aaron, don't cry over them. Man, ain't that a way to treat your kids? Don't shed a tear for your kids. People think I'm an unrighteous God. I don't want my feelings to get hurt. I killed them because I'm not a respecter of persons. I don't care if they are preacher's kids. They're living like the devil. I'm going to kill them. I'm going to kill them and leave their jackets whole. Their jackets are holy. They're not holy. I'm going to burn them up and preserve the jacket. When you go pick up the jackets out of the ashes, Aaron, high priest, Aaron, the chief priest, Aaron, the one that of all people should have turned out right, everybody, right? Because he's serving God, right? Come on, right? Wouldn't that what you'd expect? His kids wind up apostate and die and go to hell. Samuel's kids, they wind up apostate. You know what happens? They come to Samuel and they say, Hey, Samuel, we, we, want, a, we want a regular king. I'm just regurgitating everything to get you set up. I'm, I'm aware of my time. I'll give you a little extra new stuff here in, in a little while. I know this is just a recap for most of you. You already know all of this stuff. They say, give us a king. We want a king. And Samuel says, you have a king. Your king is God. You don't need a king. God's ruling you from up there. Now let's just do what God says. When He tells me, I'll tell you, y'all do it, okay? <laughs> Ain't that what He told Elijah? I'll tell you what, Elijah, uh, Ahab thinks he's running everything back here in the time of the kings. He thinks he's running the whole show there and we realize Jezebel's in there and she's the neck that turns the head and that kind of a thing. And we realize the real king is not Ahab. We realize the real king is Jezebel. Jezebel, Baal. And anyway, and so he says, I tell you what you do, call them out up there on Mount Carmel and they do what I tell them to do through you or they do what Ahab does through Baal and you find out which one's which. And they wind up having a big uh, uh, a showdown up there and the Baalite priests cut themselves and scream and holler and rant and rave and jump around till noon. Then they take a little break and then they go to the evening time, the time of the evening sacrifice between 4 and 6 in the afternoon. It would be just before 6 o'clock because that's considered the next day. And he said, all right, I've heard enough. And they bring the bottles of water and so on and so forth. You know the story. And the next thing you know, fire comes. And so Elijah thinks, okay, now they're going to do what God says. Not without a king. No, we want a king. We want a literal, physical, earthly king we can see like all the other nations. And Samuel says, you're making a big mistake. Yeah, you ain't kidding you're making a big mistake. You're making a mess, Israel. Your king's always been God. That's what sets you apart from everybody else. We want an earthly king. 
Okay, fine. The Lord says to Samuel, give him an earthly king. He did. He gave him Saul. Saul raised their taxes. Saul made them poor. Saul put burdens on them. Saul made their people get conscripted into the military. Saul wound up bankrupt in the nation. Saul wound up killing everybody that wasn't for him. Saul wound up uh, setting at odds with everybody that was there and wound up removing the priest, killed 70 of them in one place just because they were helping David. Saul wound up chasing David, a man after God's own heart, because Samuel is told to go out there and anoint a man after God's own heart. David goes out there and he said, I want you to be the king. And David said, we have a king. And the Lord said, not for long. And David said, well, I'll be a king in waiting. Even though you've anointed me, until the timing is right and you see fit to take care of it. He didn't take the kingdom, but it was a kingdom. What kind of kingdom? It was a kingdom for the nation of Israel. A kingdom where God raised up a king after his own heart. Well, the kings run all the way through there, and I've got to move along here. Take your Bible and turn quickly over to the book of Jeremiah, chapter number 22. Now that about catches you up to where we were this morning. Making any sense to you so far? Jeremiah chapter number 22. This is one of the most important doctrines in all of the Bible. And if you don't get this right, then you're going to mess up your entire Bible. To understand, there's a struggle for a throne. The second coming of Jesus Christ is mentioned more times than any three doctrines you put together anywhere, string them together. It'll be mentioned more times than any three things you can pick anywhere in the Bible. The second coming of Jesus Christ is the main theme of the Bible and right beyond that or right behind that is the kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven because the second coming of Christ is Him claiming the kingdom that He bought and paid for with His blood. All right, Jeremiah chapter number 22, you have some uh, stuff going on here talking about uh, Jeconiah here. Look him in verse number, uh, let's pick it up in 24. As I live, saith the Lord, though Keniah, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, were the sun set upon my right hand, a signet, excuse me, like a, a ring upon his right hand, yet would I pluck thee hence, thence. And I will give thee into the hand of them that seek thy life, and into the hand of them whose face thou fearest, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, the hand of the Chaldeans. And I will cast thee out, thy mother that bare thee, into another country where you are not born, and there shall ye die. But the land whereunto they desire to return thither, they, they not return, shall they not return. Is this man Kaniah a despised broken idol? Question mark. Is he a vessel wherein is no pleasure? Question mark. Wherefore are they cast out? He and his seed, he and his seed, he and his seed are cast into a land which they know not. O earth, 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 kingdom of heaven, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 30, thus saith the Lord, write ye this man, what? Childless. Why? He's setting you up for the virgin birth. A man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Who's going to sit on the throne of David? Jesus Christ. That's Jesus Christ that's going to sit there. You know what he's telling you right there in Jeremiah chapter 22? He's giving you a prophecy of the virgin birth of Christ and he's saying that you're not going to have this individual as your king. And no seed from him is going to be your king. There's going to be somebody that comes, but it won't be from him. And he cuts that portion of his name off right there and calls him Kaniah. That's how despised he is. That's how despised his seed is. After that guy comes in right there, you go into around 606, and the Babylonian kings come in, and they take the nation of Israel captive, and they stay in bondage, and both of those kingdoms are not mentioned again. Neither the kingdom of God nor the kingdom of heaven are mentioned at all until John the Baptist shows up and says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world, and he comes preaching, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now that's because Jesus Christ is coming. 
Everywhere you see the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God in that Bible, you'll notice one thing that's unusual about those things, and that is they are always mentioned together only when Jesus Christ is there, the king of both of them. That's why they show up at the same time. They don't show up at the same time for you to come with this lazy way of studying and saying, well, they show up at the same time in different synoptic passages, so they must be the same thing. The Holy Spirit has enough sense. He can actually win a spelling bee. He knows the difference in being God and being heaven. Birds can fly in heaven. They don't fly in God. Planes can fly in heaven. They can't fly in God. Kingdom of heaven is literal, physical, earthly kingdom that's there. The kingdom of heaven, and I'll give you this and come back over here in just a second, is over here. We talked about it in Matthew chapter number 3. The kingdom of heaven is a Jewish kingdom, and this takes place during this three and one half years of Jesus' ministry. He has an opportunity during a sliver of time over here to make a Jewish, predominantly Jewish church led by 12 apostles. All the way until you get up here, Acts chapter number 7. Forgot I wrote that up there. In Acts chapter number 2, the Holy Spirit is given. And in Acts chapter number 7, Stephen offers to the Jewish people that are there, he says, uh, he, he gives them the opportunity to receive the Holy Ghost. And they reject it. And he looks at the nation of Israel and says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. That time right there, as soon as they do that, the Jew is done as far as the kingdom of heaven, and now the only way they can get in is right here, the kingdom of God, and I showed you that's spiritual. When the rapture takes place, like we talked about this morning, as soon as that takes place, the body of Christ, as you know it, is closed. I shudder to write this word, but you're also referred to as a chaste or a chaste bride. You're not referred to as virgins, you're a chaste bride. Virgins have to do with 144 male virgin Jews that are here. When I say bride, I don't just mean Baptist. I mean anybody that's in the body of Christ going all the way back to the time the church began. That thing begins the preaching of the kingdom of God and that thing stops. So after the rapture takes place, just follow my chart like I showed you here, the tribulation goes on. Now you don't need to worry about this. And there's a lot of people that are making a lot of money out of a lot of foolishness that they're putting out all over DVDs and CDs and tapes and books and all that stuff and prepare you against the government and prepare you against famine and prepare you against earthquakes, prepare you for bug out bags. Somebody uh, sent me a thing the other day. It might have been Brother Kim. I don't remember. But somebody sent me the other day uh, talking about it was him uh, that the safest place for you to be during the apocalypse is to be out in Montana, come buy from him the cabins and stuff that he has out there, and once you get that cabin, make sure you sign up for his gallons or five-gallon buckets of uh, food that'll last for six months. Isn't that odd? The fellow sent me a link the other day, just thought, you, i got to have your opinion on this, i got to have your opinion on this, I need your opinion on this, I just really got to have your opinion, I value your opinion, I watch you all the time. I was, okay, all right, fine, you know, and blow me up till I bust. And so, he was, you know, and uh, it, this guy goes on for about an hour talking about all this stuff, and at the end of the thing, he's selling a book. And so I simply wrote back to the guy that wrote me about that. And I spend a lot of time answering my mail. I wrote this back to him. I said, if this guy really believes that we're going to be out of here as soon as we're going to be out of here, what is he going to do with all the money he gets from selling a book? <laughs> and then I put on there, kind of tongue in cheek, I said, let me guess, you bought a book. <laughs> you have these people that come around and they say, buy gold, buy gold, buy gold, buy gold. Okay, well, if gold, if money's not going to be any good, then why are you selling me your gold? That's right. yeah. What are you going to do with my money that I gave you? Cash. I don't care if you got a bucket full of gold, but it's, it's awful hard to carry around. Uh, people don't realize what they're talking about in the tribulation period. If you were to be here, if you had all that gold, they don't know what Baptists are like. You'd be griping because, griping because it weighed too much. He'd be thinking, man, why didn't you cash this before you gave it to me? Make me have to go to the bank and cash all this stuff? <laughs> 
During the tribulation period, you go back to the kingdom of heaven. And back here it goes, here it comes, drum roll please, and here comes the cards and letters coming in. It's okay, I'll be out of town for the first three days this week anywhere. He, anyway, here we go back, the same way it was before the cross. Kingdom of heaven always involves faith and works. If you're preaching anything other than that, reconcile this for me. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, he said, Because they loved not the truth, and they didn't receive the truth when they heard the truth, that God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, because when they had the opportunity to get the truth, they rejected the truth, so God said they'll all be damned. Well, if the gospel is the same in the tribulation as it is now, why does God damn them in the tribulation when if that's the case, once you saw the rapture take place, why don't you go ahead and get saved then? The reason is, is because you can't. God blinds you and you believe the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians 2, you read it. That's what God said He was going to do. You had an opportunity to get in by grace through faith. He shuts it down. I get frustrated with people that, that, that people listen to and send in thousands of dollars. Uh, the other day I had a huge nightmare. I woke up and woke myself up thinking that Joyce Myers was preaching at my funeral. <laughs> man, I woke up in a sweat, man. I thought to myself, there is no way. And all these people were there and stuff like that and, and they were all laughing at me. I guess that's why she was there preaching at my funeral. But I, I can't imagine... People paying, paying tens and twenties and hundreds and thousands of dollars to sit around and listen to somebody that's trying to help you now and promise you prosperity now and promise you peace and well-being now and tell you how to get along with your... And, and look at Dave down there. And here's, and here's Dave down here. And Dave has been with me for the, all these years. And Dave just knows his place. He's a good little puppy dog and we keep him locked up where he's supposed to be. And Dave knows who the preacher in the family is. <laughs> I guess he does, sister. I guess you never learned anything about a meek and quiet spirit. But it doesn't really matter to you what God thinks. Tribulation period. You don't have to worry about it. You say, why? You got out. I only gave you half of that message this morning. You're going to fly. You're going to get out. You don't have to worry about that. Now, I can promise you that during the church age, if Paul's your example, <laughs> you're liable to get anything. You can get locked in a prison cell. You can wind up getting nailed to a cross. I'm talking about your ancestors. I'm talking about your heritage. I'm talking about being sawn, to, uh, sawn in a bag with rattlesnakes in it. I'm talking about hanging you out there over a river with rattlesnakes in the bag and throwing you in there and the snakes feel like they're going to drown. They're biting you and biting you and biting you until you drown, staking you out there with low tide and let the tide come in and laughing and mocking and making fun of you, having the Japanese take you out there and put you on a cross and let that thing, the water just beat you and beat you and beat you day in and day out until you wind up your flesh just gives way and starts falling off of you. You say, why? Men torturing men for their belief in Christ. You're not promised anything until you get to the other side. You could have that happen to you. But if you put the kingdom of heaven there, you'll think, well, the only reason that's happening to you, you've probably heard this before, you must not be living right. Well, Paul lived right and he got it in the cotton picking neck. Read it. 1 Corinthians 11. A day and a night in the deep and beaten how many times? Five times, uh, 40 stripes, save one. Uh, in jail and prison, naked and ashamed and hungering and fastings often and, and uh, the care of the churches and uh, uh, having so much trouble and tribulation. Wow, Paul, the victorious life. Paul's like, yeah, well, my victory is in my faith in Christ. Yes. Not in the fact that what he's doing. You say, why? That kingdom's gone. We're in a different kingdom now. In this kingdom now, during the time of the church age, your, your, uh, your blessings are spiritual. The blessings are spiritual. All right, Matthew chapter 4. Uh, well, can you give me just a couple minutes? I hope I'm not boring you to death. Matthew chapter number 4. Now, when Jesus Christ shows up, He's offering both of those kingdoms to, uh, to them if they'll take them. And they won't take them. That uh, church age kingdom comes in Ephesians 1.
All right, look, if you will, please, in Matthew chapter number 4, and let's see, pick it up in verse number 17. Now, you want to get what I'm about to give you here, and you'll better understand. Matthew 4, verse 17, from the time Jesus began to preach to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Jesus has now finished His baptism and He's starting His ministry. Look in Matthew chapter number 5, look in verse number 3. Make it verse 2. And He, Jesus, opened His mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of what? Heaven. Well, is that your kingdom? No, that kingdom is a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. It's not your kingdom. Well, if you just be poor in spirit, then yours is, you, you earn the kingdom of heaven. You don't earn anything by your works. You earn you, yours by faith. It's given to you as a free gift. Now watch, continue on, and you'll understand. Blessed are they that mourn, blessed are the meek. Uh, they shall inherit what? Is that what you're supposed to get? No. Your inheritance is gold, silver, and precious stone, or wood, hay, and stubble. You're entitled to the, your, your title deed is a mansion in the New Jerusalem. You don't inherit the earth. Who's he talking to? Say it again. Okay, who's talking? Jesus. When is he talking? Good. Now you just learned more than probably 90% of the preachers in America. You're paying attention to what your Bible is saying and you're looking at who's talking and who they're talking and when they're talking and now you're starting to go, oh, wait a minute. They are looking for this. So that's why when he says those things, if they do that, it works and this is what they get. A literal, physical, earthly kingdom and the right to rule and rank. They shall inherit the... Alright, good. Now watch, go a little bit further. Blessed are they, verse number 10, which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. You're persecuted in the tribulation for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of what? Is is future. They suffer the persecution now, they get it later. It talks about them being the salt of the earth and so on and so forth. Uh, come on down to verse number 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these commandments... Watch it careful. The least of these commandments, and shall teach men so, he shall be called at the last of the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the... Since when did you read anything about you doing anything to inherit something? But somebody that not only teaches it but does it is called great in the kingdom of heaven. Verse number 20, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall succeed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of... He just said you can't get in without works. Your righteousness has to exceed them. Well, now, preacher, we realize all our righteousness is filthy rags and all that. You're crossing the kingdoms. You're crossing the kingdoms. We get His righteousness. That's why He did that. No, right now, the kingdom of God is not known. So He is telling them, you got to be righteous to get in. you got to do it, not just say it. Faith without works is dead. All right, now he comes on down through there and what he is trying to get across to you is, look at verse number 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am come, uh, not, not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Oh, so he's got to do the law. Okay, the context is the kingdom of heaven. The Jews waiting on the kingdom of heaven. He's coming to fulfill the law, not do away with it. He doesn't do away with the law till Calvary. And that's how you wind up getting in. Now, let me give you one more here. Look at Mark chapter number 1. Mark chapter 1, and there may be two more. If you get a hold of this thing, man, your Bible will all of a sudden open up to you, and it won't be like, well, I read my Bible, I just don't understand it. You'll be able to say, man, thank the Lord I wasn't born in the, under the law. Man, thank the Lord I wasn't born under the law. Man, thank the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm under grace. Thank God I'm going home to heaven. Thank God my ticket's bought and paid for. It'll make you have a shouting fit. 
Anybody that is trying to put you, for the sake of our discussion, on what would be your left, my right, on the other side of Calvary, you need to be real careful about because they're trying to put you back under the book of Galatians has to do with adding works to your salvation. Amen. You're on this side of Calvary. Over there, when they had a drought of fishes come in, the net broke. After Calvary, when Pete's pulling in the, uh, the, the fish over there, the net doesn't break. Because if you get on the right side of the cross, you have eternal security. Over there, you have tares that can be bad and animals that can be bad and other land and seeds and ground that can be bad. Over here, you don't have to worry about all that stuff. You say, why? I'm in a whole different kingdom altogether. You're in a kingdom made for you. The Lord made it easy. I'm going to probably insult you by saying this, but he realized that a, Jew, a Gentile is not generally as intelligent as a Jew. So I call it the gospel for imbeciles. He just said, you know what? You can't really teach an old dog new tricks, so I'm just going to make it easy for that dog to get in. I'll make it easy for you. All you have to do is accept me and be your master. <laughs> you say, if I try to explain the law to you and ask you to have the discipline to keep it, it's not in your nature. You're Gentiles. Jews by nature or tend to be more disciplined in regular life than you and I. That's in their nature. That's Shemite nature. The Lord said, man, I got a conundrum here. I can't save them the same way. Half of them won't get saved. Gentiles are called slow bellies in the Bible. They're, they're, when it comes to religious things, you tend to be lazy. That's Gentile way. You're okay if, you know, they bring it to you, but if you've got to get up out of your easy chair and even drive through the drive through it's like, pfft, I don't know. But, no, I'm serious. Much study is a weariness of the flesh. That Jew will plow, out, plow it down, plow it out, and he'll try to live it and try to be, because he tends to be self-righteous by nature. You realize you're not righteous by nature, and you're just kind of like, oh, well, I ain't narcissist. I don't care. I'll do what I want. <laughs> so you know what the Lord did? He made a gospel for imbeciles. He said, I'll give it to you for free. Amen. Amen. That's what he said. I'll give it to you for nothing. I'll pay the price. All you have to do, I got the tab. All you got to do is show up. Amen. I'm glad I was born a Gentile. Amen. You say, why? It's hard for a Jew to accept anything for nothing. He wants to work for everything. That's what makes him excel in business and stuff. But you Gentiles, you line up at the welfare line so fast it'll make your head swim. <laughs> And God knew that when He offered you the gospel. Mm -hmm. I know you're, some of you are the exception. I apologize. Y'all are like, oh my Lord, you know. I, but, but it's true. By nature, study history. And so the Lord cared enough about you to give you an easy way to get in. It's easy on you, but it was hard on Him. Yeah. All right, let me show you this in Mark chapter number 1, and then I'll give you one more in Luke 4, and then we'll call it a, 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 an evening and pick it up next Sunday. Mark chapter 1, verse number 14. Now after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the kingdom of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. The gospel he's telling them to believe there is the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. It's not the gospel of the kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom of God is not even known. But he is simply making a definitive statement. The kingdom of God's at hand. If you accept me, you're going to get them both. So repent and accept the gospel. What gospel? You think Jesus Christ is going to tell them to preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven and he's going to preach a different gospel? Well, that'd make him a blasphemer. Look at Luke chapter number 4, please. Make any sense at all? He said, it's at hand. He's just making a statement. It's right here. It's looking at you. I'm the king of both of them. If you accept me for what you understand, you get a door prize. But they, they didn't do what he told them to do. Luke chapter number 4. Luke chapter number 4. People get this idea that just because uh, the Lord is there... And he says the king comes preaching the kingdom of God that they think all of a sudden, oh, well, wait a minute now. If he's preaching the kingdom of God, then they must have a way to get saved by grace through faith. How? 
Can you tell me how? What would they have preached? It hadn't even been revealed to Paul yet. It's called the mystery of the gospel. What is it? How that Christ died for your sins. Oh, he's preaching he hasn't even died yet. Was buried. He's still alive. And rose again the third day. He hadn't even gone to the cross. How could they preach that when it hasn't even happened? He's preaching the coming kingdom. I'm here. I'm here. I'm the guy. That woman at the well in John 4, she had some sense. Are you that guy? We've heard about you. Syrophoenician woman, half-breed. You know what the Lord said? Now you understand in Matthew 10, now do you understand the majority of the time when Jesus is speaking before Calvary, you see kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, 33 times in 32 verses. You know why you see so much of that done? You say, but kingdom of God is in there 70 times. Yeah, but look at where it's in there. It's not in there in the beginning part of that. You know why that thing comes up? The Lord said, Go not to the way of the Gentile, but only the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now do you know why? They're looking for that. You ain't looking for that. You're not looking for somebody to float down out of the sky and come down here and take over things like people out west preach to you all the time. Jesus is going to rapture you out of here. Amen. So after you go through the tribulation, you must be on the take or something to be that stupid. Somebody must be paying you or you must be making money off of DVDs or some, something somewhere, somewhere along the line. There's no way the Holy Spirit showed you that. You can't be that ignorant. Not, you're just ignoring Scripture. You're blinded by your anger or by your jealousy or envy, something. You, you can't see that. Now, you have to go home and pray about it and think about it or whatever, and I'm not asking you to believe what I say just because I say it and because you like me and all that kind of stuff. You go home and believe it and pray about it if you want to, if the Holy Spirit confirms it through His Word. If it doesn't, throw it in the trash. But if He confirms it, then that's the deal. You get a piece about it. It's like, yeah, I believe that's right. You don't fight it all the time. Luke chapter number 4. The Bible says this in verse number 5. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain showed him all the what? Kingdom. kingdom of this world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give to thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. I guess it is. Why? Way back in the garden. Wherever my other drawing is. Way back in the garden, Adam gave it back to the devil. And the devil's had human instrumentation all the way through there. He said, all that power I give unto thee, for whomsoever I will give it. Why? He owns it. Now, if you want to know something, and I have a whole deal on it, I'm not going to have time to go into it now. This is where your flat earth people come in. He, the devil took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms. So the earth has to be flat. Because he saw that kingdom and he saw that kingdom and he saw that kingdom. Now see, you know what I love about you? You have this thing of, of your initial response is, oh, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> it, and you thought it. You didn't say it. How could anybody be so ignorant of something like that? But you get stuck in this mindset about a flat earth. You start picking verses out of the Bible to try to fit your theology. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Since, no, since Adam gave it to him back in Genesis and all the way through to where Jesus was and into the future, if it continued on, he said, that's all been given to me. And if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give it to you. You just have to worship me. That's all the way back to before Genesis 1-1. I'm going to have my throne above your throne. You bow down and worship me. He's after the same throne. And the kingdoms he's showing him there are every kingdom that has been and every kingdom that is and every kingdom that will be in a spherical earth and showing him not just the kingdoms that are reigning at the time, but the ones that will reign. And he said, they've been given to me. And the Lord says, you need to get behind me. You need to get in line. You're out of line. You're going to follow me. You know, I'm not following you. That's what he's basically saying. Now, why is that so? Because the devil has the kingdom right now. But they're literal, physical, earthly kingdoms. He doesn't have the other one. And as soon as the rapture happens and after the tribulation, the devil realizes his time is but a short time and he's really angry. And he comes down here and tries to eradicate the Jew. No kidding. Why would he be so interested in eradicating the Jew? Who is the kingdom of heaven promised to? Jesus. 
Now do you know? It's not just because that's God's chosen people. It's like, well, you know, you wanted the Jewish people to inherit the literal, physical, earthly kingdom. There ain't none left. I done killed them all. Hitler was anti-Semitic. So was Stalin, your ally. And Churchill and Roosevelt and Truman all knew about it and went along with it. Cha-ching! Cha-ching! IBM, Ford Motor Company, um, uh, uh, General Motors, and two or three other ones. You have no idea, you know, who was making uh, vehicles for the war machine that was fighting against you? Ford. Henry Ford said he didn't see it as a conflict. You know how to picture of Henry Ford hanging in the, uh, the wolf's lair? Hitler considered him to be a, uh, a monetary giant, an icon that should be looked up to for his business savvy. Who didn't know that, did you? Go check it out. It's a historical fact. Why do you think you were slow, slow to get in the war? It's going to cost you money. You got free labor. The big boys that are behind all that was going on up there in Washington, they're behind the scenes going, now hold on just a minute there, Prez. Uh, we put you in office and we can take you out of office. You say never happened. Ask John Kennedy if it couldn't happen. Right. Or Jack, whatever you want to call him that whoremonger up there, you say, well, the mafia snuffed him because he's messing around. Uh-uh. No, sir. He was going to stop the war in Vietnam, and the boy that was putting out the Bell helicopters that was financing the large portion of all the military weapons and out there was uh, a Rothschild. Conspiracy theorist. No, historical fact. And because he had decided with the guy that we had set up, the, the straw dog that we put down in South Vietnam, uh, we set him up down there, set him up to, to be the ruler of it, and we were controlling him like a puppet. And him and Jack got together and they said, okay, we're going to bring this war to a halt. And the next thing you know, the guy in South Vietnam is killed in a black ops CIA operation. And the next thing you know, within two weeks, John Kennedy was dead in Texas. Coincidence. And President Johnson was in. And Johnson and Nixon and um, it'll come to me in a minute that winds up being a president and the head of the FBI at the time, a real pervert named J. Edgar Hoover. I speak with good authority on that. A real weirdo, freakazoid, whack job. Those four sat down at Camp David and planned the whole thing out. And after it was over, three of those four wind up being your future presidents and the war in Vietnam continued right on. Johnson came in and then, you know, Nixon came in and, then, and it ran on the way through there and then Ford. Historical fact. When it don't make sense, there's a buck in it. You say, surely not. You are nothing but cannon fodder. That's why if you learn to live for Jesus Christ, your life will amount to something. And if it doesn't, you don't matter. It is a mind over matter day. We don't mind and you don't matter. That's the new slogan. You're just cannon fodder. They're not looking out for you. They're lying in their pockets. Who care nothing about you. Well, then we should have an insurrection. We should have a rapture, yeah. an insurrection. Are you going to get your pitchforks and all that and charge Washington or whatever? What a thing. French Revolution, Industrial Revolution. We're going to have a revolution. We the people, we the people, we the people. You sound like Laodicea. How about Jesus? I'm going to continue this, and as you can tell, it gets a little bit complex, and we'll continue to break it down, hopefully, until you become a, a genius about these things where you're able to get it. And then if I kick off, then you'll be able to pick it up and carry on. Amen. The greatest thing I can do you is teach you until you is running out your ears, like the quail ran out of the Israelites from eating meat. And that's the best thing I can do to prepare you for what's coming. 
whether you got a bucket full of food or not, and whether you raise organic vegetables or not, and whether you got some kind of battery to charge your house or solar energy, or you have a way to purify water from the swamp and, you know, all that kind of st stuff like that. Or if it's an EMP, you got your house wrapped in cellophane or foil or whatever it might be. The best thing I can do to prepare you for whatever's coming is, is give you the book, the book, the book, the book, the book, the book. Amen. Because after all is said and done, you know what will be here? The book, the book, the book, the book. And the author of that book. I, did anybody check me to see if I was telling you the truth that, you did, that your generals and your admirals were against, with one exception, were against the dropping of the atomic bomb, Hiroshima, and then were vehemently against it being dropped on Nagasaki? Did anybody check it? Well, there's your homework. Check it. You've been fed a line by Truman that we've saved all these millions of soldiers and this and that and the other and people on both sides and all that. You destroyed a whole nation so you could take over their banking system. You. Einstein's the one that wrote the letter that persuaded the president to use it and regretted it till the day he died. Worst thing he said I ever did was write that letter to persuade them to use that. If you didn't have Russian troops, a million or more of them coming in on the north end up there where Japan had taken over China, that thing would probably still be going on to this day. You had your head handed to you in Korea. Yeah. You say, we fought to a draw. i draw my foot. There's one or two good battles there. Chesty Puller comes out one time. They're all surrounded and they said, what are you going to do? He said, charge. <laughs> He said, they're all around us on both sides. He said, well, pick a side and run right at them. And then he said, follow me or I die alone. And they fought their way out of the thing. But that's an unusual, that's a true story too. That's a highly decorated Marine. But that was it. We're, we're surrounded. Charge. <laughs> oh, that's a great spirit. I hope this stuff helps you. I, I find that people are not as uh, 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 rebellious. It, it, more than that, they're just uninformed. Yeah. And, I, and I hold preachers accountable for that. You've been fed too much of this, do right, live right, be right, spit white, you know, quit, don't stop, you know, God, trust this and trust that and all that. And you don't have any Bible. And you need to have the Bible rightly divided so you've got something with some substance you can sink your teeth in. I'll give you the credit for telling you that you're, you're smart enough, I believe, to get it. I don't believe the Lord would have given it if He didn't intend for you to have it. Yeah. Who am I to tell you you can't have it? I get up there and the Lord said, what do you keep that stuff locked up for? You say, well, what happens if people misinterpret it and the cards and letters come in? Oh, well, <laughs> iron sharpeneth iron. When you get questions about it, write them down. We'll go over them. Give me a chance to look at them first, though, so I don't look like an idiot. <laughs> All right, let's stand together and be dismissed. Don't you love Sunday nights? Yes. It's good, isn't it? That's, a, that's just a blessing. And pray for us this week. We'll be north of uh, Knoxville uh, for three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and um, be back on Thursday night, Thursday evening late, and uh, pray the Lord will get something done up there. And... We'll have a good meeting, and then I'll plan on being here. The boys will take good care of you on Wednesday, and then we'll be back for uh, Sunday services.